<laughs> Coming up on Pet Heroes, two Great Danes come to the rescue when an infant falls into an icy pool. And a duck enlists the help of several police officers when her ducklings become trapped in a storm drain. Hi, I'm Jason McCoy and welcome to Pet Heroes. Animals often develop a special bond with their offspring and sometimes that bond will extend outside their own species. But when disaster strikes and that special bond is put to the test, what spurs these animals into action? We look at two stories of animals responding to babies in danger. Doug and Karen Lyle now live in sunny White Rock, British Columbia. But before that, they had lived in Regina Beach, Saskatchewan, where Doug had taken a position with the government. And the young couple found themselves searching for a home. And we found this lovely home on the water with the pool. And um, <clears throat> I knew right away that that would be the one. And we brought our pets with us. We had um, several pets at that point in time. We had Amadeus, our Great Dane, and we had uh, a, a cat, Schwartzy. Karen and Doug try for a number of years to get pregnant with no success. In the interim, they decide to breed Amadeus and soon have eight purebred Great Dane pups. Bambi was the pick of the litter. She was the biggest dog and she was just gorgeous. And um, she was the first one that went to a new home. Eventually we just had uh, the, the run to the litter, Bridget. And I said, that's it, Doug. I, I can't part with her. We're going to keep her, and she's going to be a companion for Amadeus. About that time, Amadeus developed bone cancer. And so we realized that she would not be around for very long. Shortly after losing Amadeus to illness, the prize of the litter, Bambi, is returned to Karen and Doug. Bambi's reunion with the family is not the only reason for celebration. Karen and Doug learn they are pregnant. And we were very excited because we tried for so, such a long time. And um, when Forrest was born, the dogs just adored him right from day one. And he was so comfortable with them. We brought him home, we put him in the cradle, and they just stuck by him all the time. They were always where the crib or the cradle or the blankets were. They were, they were just attached to this child. He was theirs. It was like it was we brought home a puppy for them or something. <laughs> And he, he loved them too, like he, he got very used to them and he, he was never disturbed by the, their barks. I think he probably got used to it when he was in the womb because they, they weren't ferocious barkers and they just alert us to things. I thought Bridget and Bambi were two other parents. They um, taught me how to walk by just holding on to their tail. Wendy McClellan, a doctor of veterinary medicine, offers her unique perspective on animal behavior. Bridget and Bambi are responding to a pheromone, or scent, that baby Forrest gives off. A pheromone lets them know that that baby needs to be watched closely. If a female dog smells that pheromone, they will become extremely protective. We just had a lovely home, a lovely setup, and everything was going well. By April of 1995, things have taken a downward turn. Doug has lost his job and expenses are piling up. The couple tries to sell their beautiful home and face giving up Bambi and Bridget as they can no longer afford them. It was still very cold in Saskatchewan. Uh, Doug realized that we had to make the house a little bit more marketable because it was April and we needed to sell it pretty quickly. And so he opened the pool. As was his habit, he went daily to the post office, which was about three blocks away, maybe not even a ten, well, a five minute drive and he would check to see if he had any responses to the resumes we'd submitted and put in the new batch of resumes that we were sending out. While Doug is at the post office, Karen sits at the computer working on his resume. I was in a hallway that was just outside the family room and I'd set Forrest up on a blanket in the middle of the carpets and the dogs were right beside him. It wasn't two minutes. I looked at him, he was playing happily, and I maybe typed two sentences when the dog was barking. Bambi's barking quickly alerts Karen that something is terribly wrong. I realized the doors were slightly ajar. Like, 
not even a foot. Bridget must have even had to struggle to get through that little wedge. She was quite a bit smaller than Bambi. Bambi, it was impossible. She couldn't even, she could barely get her head through the door. Then I realized something was wrong when I saw Bridget in the pool. And I initially thought she'd fallen in the pool. Why is she in the pool? Like, it's cold. Why is she in the pool? And then I saw forest sleepers in the water. I just stood there and I didn't know what to do. Floating face down in the near freezing water is Karen and Doug's 13-month-old son, Forrest. After the break, Bridget and Bambi struggle to get Forrest out of the icy cold pool. But will it be too late? I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. 13-month-old Forrest has opened the sliding door and fallen into the pool in near freezing temperatures. As soon as I got the door open, Bambi just pushed past me and jumped straight into the pool. Bambi quickly joins Bridget, who is already in the pool. Bridget and Bambi act quickly, working together to get Forrest out of the icy water. I didn't dive. I didn't stop to remove clothes. I didn't stop to do anything. I just ran into the pool. As soon as I got in the water and had him in my arms, and the two of them, it was almost like they were sheepdogs coming in behind me and pushing me, pushing me towards the stairs. He was so cold, and um, I turned him over, and he wasn't breathing at all. He, he, his eyes were shut, he wasn't breathing. And I got forced out of the water, and I ran back into the house, and I dialed 911. Acclaimed animal expert and wildlife conservationist Brian Keating shares his insight. Most dogs will treat uh, uh, small humans in the pack, baby humans in the pack, as puppies. So uh, remember, these dogs have all come, genetically speaking, from a pack environment. And to support the alpha male and alpha female, the end result would be to build the pack numbers with, uh, with offspring that survive. So when an offspring is in trouble, of course, that pack behavior is going to step in. Karen panics as she realizes Forrest still isn't breathing. Her CPR training is rendered useless as she begins to go into shock. I couldn't remember anything. I knew CPR, I couldn't remember it. I just wanted him to fix everything right then and there. I wanted it to be fixed. But the operator is unable to help in Karen's panic state. I'm screaming at him, he's falling in the pool, he's not breathing, and he's trying to tell me how to do CPR. And I, I couldn't stop and focus long enough to listen to him. And he's telling me, he, he's being so blunt with me, I can't help you unless you stop and listen to me. And the dogs were right next to me. They wouldn't, they were like right up beside me. Bridget and Bambi stay close by baby Forrest. They will not leave his side. Great Danes were originally bred for guard dogs, but over time they've been bred to be more mild-mannered and easygoing, but that protective guarding instinct still exists. Karen has no way to reach Doug while he's away at the post office, but when he returns home, chaos has erupted. I didn't hear anything until after the garage door closed behind me. Then I heard Karen scream. The patio doors leading to the pool were wide open, and Forrest was lying in a big puddle of water on the carpet. His lips were blue. Seeing his son on the floor unconscious, Doug quickly puts his Canadian Forces training to use. I went and began giving him mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. And uh, after a little bit, he seemed to cough and spit up some water and then he'd stop breathing again. Forrest had stopped breathing again, and I remember the responder saying, just keep doing the resuscitation. After almost three minutes, Forrest finally shows signs of life. By this time, paramedics have been dispatched from Regina, but it's 60 kilometers away. No, he's not, he's not breathing. The 911 dispatcher asks to speak with Doug after Forrest stops breathing again. And he said, are you covering the baby's uh, nostrils and mouth at the same time? 
And I said, no, just the mouth. And he said, well, okay, cover the nostrils and mouth. And when we did that, um, the results were quite a bit better. Paramedics arrive and waste little time in treating Forrest as they try to stabilize him. They came right in, uh, got right to work on him, you know, with uh, some kind of advice that got oxygen right to him. Once Forrest is breathing on his own, the paramedics load him up and set out for the hospital in Regina. I went in the ambulance with Forrest and I just was praying the whole time. While the emergency room doctors work on Forrest, Karen and Doug try to stay positive. And then the doctor came out and he just had this best smile I could see on anybody's face. He said, your son is gonna be okay. They took me to see him and he was awake and kind of groggy, uh, but he was alert, and he, he said, Mommy, and I, I just, I couldn't believe it. The doctors believe that the shock of the extremely cold water caused Forrest's vital functions to shut down very rapidly, effectively allowing him to survive long enough for Bridget and Bambi to alert Karen. Karen had resigned herself to staying with him throughout, so I went back probably late afternoon. I went back into the house and I could not find the dogs. And I went up. <laughs> Sorry. <clears throat> the fourth room and the two of them were jammed under his crib. I have no idea how long they were there for. With Forrest not being in the crib, obviously the dog knows that especially after the afternoon's occurrences, that, that something is amiss. So certainly the dog would recognize that there's a missing individual and, uh, and would want to display to the alpha male and female that uh, it's concerned. I think the dog would be showing loyalty to the pack or devotion to the, the missing individual of the pack, uh, being Little Forrest. After keeping Forrest under observation for three days, doctors finally allow him to return home. The dogs beyond excited. I mean, they were like we'd been away for six months and they stuck to him like glue. There was nowhere we could go with him that they were immediately beside us. Our house was still for sale and things were no better financially. People were saying to us, it's time to get rid of the animals. You can't afford the animals. And it, Doug and I just couldn't bear to part with the dogs. The house is finally sold and the family starts fresh in White Rock, British Columbia. Doug and my father drove out with the dogs and I flew out with the children. Shortly after their move, Karen and Doug receive a call from a company wanting to honor Bridget and Bambi for their part in rescuing Forrest. The award includes a lifetime supply of dog food. I truly believe they were like angels in our lives for, that were there for a reason that we, they came back into our lives for a reason that um, we kept Bridget the runt of the litter that nobody wanted for a reason and that Bambi returned to us after four years with another family for a reason and, and that's what it was meant to be. Forrest, now grown up, divides his time between running, swimming and playing football. He hopes one day to become a pilot in the Canadian Air Force. When I first heard this story, I was actually really shocked, like I never knew about this and um, I, it was just felt like a blessing for me to be still here. Bambi and Bridget pass on within a year of each other, living almost 12 years, a healthy lifespan for Great Danes. I think almost every day about how fortunate we were to have had them there. Yeah, we were ex extraordinarily lucky to have these dogs in our lives. They were amazing. I miss them every day. Up next, a duck desperately tries to get the attention of a police officer when her ducklings are in danger. We just saw how Bridget and Bambi were quick to react when baby Forrest was in danger. 
In our next story, we look at how a mother duck responds when her little ducklings become trapped. Nicholas Reed is a professor of journalism at Langara College here in Vancouver. Before that, he had been a reporter. I was working as a reporter at the Vancouver Sun. Uh, it was my job to write about animals at the time. If you look into it, um, you can find any number of horror stories uh, involving people and animals. So this was a nice change. This was a story about uh, an animal rescuing her own, but also human beings coming to the aid of that animal. It happened in July 2001, uh, not far from where we are. This is Granville Street Bridge, heading into downtown. And uh, there was a community police officer named Ray Peterson. He was on duty at the time. Now retired, Ray Peterson thinks back to his days as a community police officer. Uh, the community police office is, is an office that the uh, city, they set up in a commercial area where people can come to report minor crimes. Ray begins his shift at 4 a.m. After checking on the local businesses, he decides to head to his office. It was after 5, probably 5.30, I guess. So it was very early in the morning, and there was nobody around. And that's when I ran into the duck. At first, Ray tries to ignore the duck's strange behavior. And I thought, you know, that's weird. Why would, you know, why would a duck do this? And that's why I thought the duck, something was wrong or the duck was injured. Still didn't figure out what was going on until finally the duck went back up to lay down. That's when I discovered that the little babies were down in the uh, sewer. After finding the ducklings in distress, Ray decides to call for backup. Allison Hill, an officer with the Vancouver Police Service, remembers that morning. On July 11th, I was working what we call Alpha Shift, and it's from 4.30 in the morning until about 4 in the afternoon. When this call came over the air, I mean, there was a note of humor in her voice. Attentional units, we have uh, a duck underneath the Granville Street Bridge who appears to have her ducklings um, down in the storm sewer. Allison arrives on the scene and assesses the situation. When I arrived, if the duck was intimidated by all of us being around, she didn't indicate anything like that. She clearly stood around. And, and clearly knew that we were gonna be the ones who were gonna help out to rescue her ducklings. The slats in the grate were about four or five centimeters apart. So you could see how the mother duck could walk across the grate and then all of her ducklings fell through as they followed her. While we were trying to figure out what to do with the ducklings, the duck was standing calmly watching us and watching the grate and watching us. And, and I, her calmness, to me, was amazing. Another officer arrives on the scene, and together they try to remove the storm drain. Upon first review, it would be hard to understand why the duck would stick around with so many people coming in. I mean, obviously, its initial fight at the pant leg of the policeman didn't work, and now there's more people arriving. One would think the duck would just get out of there, and some birds might do that, as some mammals might do that. But what we have to all remember is that from a survival perspective, it's uh, imperative that our parent remain firmly bonded to us for as long as is reasonably possible to ensure our survival. With, in the case of birds, the bird will continue to respond in a protective manner, or at least it'll continue to hover in the area as long as it continues to hear its chicks peep. A dispatcher came over the air and suggested that we have a towing company come out, and we thought that was a good idea because the, the tow truck had pulled it right out. A tow truck arrived on scene, and it backed up into the area. And the duck just stood there, watching and quacking. Like she didn't go anywhere. And that's, again, it just amazed me how she stood her ground. A resident has lent the officers a soup strainer to try and retrieve the ducklings from the storm drain. Once the grate was up, as I recall, Ray went down on his belly and he scooped out the ducklings. 
As every duckling came out, the mom greeted every duckling. It was like a tussle of the feathers or a beak to beak. As though to say, like, oh, am I ever glad to see you? I can see a theme uh, uh, with, with adult individuals protecting perceived offspring or real offspring. I see a very big difference in the programmed behavior of the duck vs behavior of the dog. I think the dog is a manifestation of, of 15,000 years of, of honing, but already coming to the table with a set of genetics that give it a very much a pack uh, mentality and a pack protective mentality. With the duck, it was simply looking to make sure that its youngsters survived. Biologically, this duck has a lot invested in her offspring. She'll do whatever it takes to protect them, even if it puts her in harm's way. It was a child's storybook about animals come to life in a way. A lot of us grow up listening to stories about animals who have human qualities. They speak, they wear human clothes, they do uh, human things. And here was an, a real life animal who did something that I think most people would have only believed could happen in a storybook. In animals, as with humans, the bond between a mother and her babies is a sacred one. And whether duck, dog, or human, there's a maternal instinct that kicks in, which spurs animals into action. Bridget and Bambi were quick to react when they noticed baby Forrest in danger, alerting his mother Karen to the situation and saving his life. While the mother duck put herself in a potentially dangerous situation when her little ducklings were in trouble. <laughs> 